to everyone who came out tonight. We are here with uh, Dr. Eric Jacuzzi. Before I introduce him, we have a few housekeeping things. Next week, we have Sandia National Labs coming back with AIAA alumni Alex Chen. And then we have the following week our alumni panel. So AIAA members who are students here at NC State are coming back to talk. Should see a lot of familiar faces, but it should be a lot of fun. Um, there is the attendance QR code you can scan, the attendance links in the chat. And before I hand it over to Dr. Jacuzzi, just a little bit about him. He graduated from NCSU with a doctorate in aerospace engineering and is the senior director of aerodynamics at NASCAR. So the floor is yours. All right. So I don't use Zoom a ton, but I think I can navigate my way around it. Um, Brian, can you make him um, a co-host? Oh, you got it already. What? Oh, yeah, we switched it. Okay. <laughs> That's showing up correctly? Yep. Yeah, so thanks for the intro and thanks for having me. A um, little bit about... so. I guess in general, this talk is kind of like Aero and NASCAR. I get a lot of questions like, well, what does NASCAR need a PhD in Aero or why does NASCAR have this or that? So I'll hopefully in inform you a little bit about the company, a little bit about AIAA, how I met uh, Josh um, and, and a little bit about my background. So it's kind of a general talk, like a little bit of car aerodynamics, a little bit of everything. So that's sort of where we're going. Um, you can see my education here. So I went to a little tiny university called Kettering in Flint, Michigan, which used to be General Motors Institute. Very famous for having a co-op program. Um, unfortunately, you don't learn a lot about research. So I had to do that later on. Um, so I went to the University of Michigan, um, got my master's in aero, and then swore I would never get another graduate degree. And then I ended up at NC State working full time for NASCAR um, and got my PhD. I defended in, uh, I guess it would have been 2020, so February 2020, um, and officially graduated in May. Um, so that was kind of my education history. Um, my job is now I am senior director of Aero at NASCAR. So I lead our uh, R&D Aero efforts. Um, we use every tool available, so CFD, wind tunnel, track testing. A lot of my job is kind of deciding how we should do things and why we should do things. And, you know, it's not it's not so much being an expert in any one thing. It's sort of like steering the ship, right? And hopefully I do a better job than the guy in Egypt. It's where we don't crash into the side. Um, so I, uh, you know, I manage the arrow rules for all the series um, and even the lower series now and represent NASCAR and the big thing, like I said, investing in the appropriate technologies um, to advance NASCAR. But the job itself is pretty high stress. Uh, it takes a kind of a unique personality um, for my whole team, honestly. Um, so let me show you a video of a bad day for us. So this was in uh, 2017. So ooh, that one, he didn't quite flip over. So that was good. Um, so this, here's a slow-mo view. So part of what we do is safety, right? So we don't want these things flying into the stands. This is where it went real bad. Um, so this is Friday night about 11 p.m. First race of the season, by the way. So you can see it in slow-mo again. Basically gets turned and then that truck completely flips over. This is the uh, truck series here. Um, so by 7 a.m. the next morning, we had a running liftoff model in CFD of this truck. And uh, we ended up, this is actually taken at a, um, you can see the CFD model in the bottom right corner. So you can see these dark black areas, very low pressure. So a lot of lift on the bed of the truck when the truck is spinning. Um, so we did all that in about three days. And four weeks later, we were at the, this is the Fiat Chrysler tunnel in Auburn Hills, which is now the Stellantis tunnel or however they say that. Um, but basically this solution came from CFD. So 
the fun thing about NASCAR compared to Formula One, and I know a lot of people that do both, and I've kind of done things in both worlds. Um, in NASCAR, we have to deal with like do things cheaply and do things efficiently, right? So we couldn't go and say that you have to change all the chassis under this and all that. So we had to use what was there and come up with solutions. And so you can see what we did. In this top right corner, you can see, so the truck would lift off at about 125 miles an hour um, before this black line. And we got that up by about 30 and you can see it substantially more at other points. So let me show you what that looks like um, in, so this, that first race was in February of 2017. And this race was about two and a half months later. So here's the difference between the two with similar incidents. So you can see the flaps deploying. The big thing to notice is you can see the skid marks on the rear tires. So that means the lift on the back was very, um, you know, greatly reduced compared to before. And this is a pretty gnarly accident, very similar to what happened before where a truck got turned right into the wall. Um, everyone was safe and okay, but we were really happy with how all this turned out. You can see everything open, it even gets help to lift off into the air, but comes right back down. So this was an example of a very, very fast project for us that was, uh, you know, in a way beneficial, you can see the results of what we did. Um, here's a good slow-mo shot. So NASCAR is unique in, it's a unique environment from an aero perspective compared to the military stuff. Military stuff, I think it's super cool. Um, I think a lot of that's awesome, but very, very long time frames, right? So like, you know, decades and, and years and years and years. So we do things really fast. So we come up with a solution and, and eight weeks later, we're like racing it, right? So it, it's a little different in that way. Um, it's not to say one's better than the other, it's just you have to be that kind of person. So um, so that's an example of that. So our current project, I'm sure some of you have seen the next gen car. So we're gonna have an all new car in 2022. Um, this is it at Winshire. So on the left, the car is in one of the best wind tunnels in the world going 180 miles an hour standing still. And on the right, that was the first test with our uh, headache inducing wrap on it. But uh, you can see the big red uh, stop button on the left there. So that's what I hit when things are going sideways, but you don't do that very often because uh, it gets expensive. Um, so yeah, so I thought I'd go into a little bit of kind of aero for road and race cars and what the big differences are. So aerodynamic forces on a car, just like a plane, right? So you got drag, you have lift, and you have side force. The difference is uh, drag, same as an airplane, slows you down. Uh, lift, we want the opposite. So we want downforce, and I'll get into why you want that. So you don't want, you don't want the car to want to go up, because that's a bad thing. And then um, side force and yawing moment are important to a road car, too, for stability reasons. So you don't want a car to get a big wind gust and want to turn one way or the other. We've all experienced that, whether a truck's passing you or, you know, you come out of a tunnel and there's a huge wind gust or something like that. So, so those are important factors. And you can imagine a race car going three times, four times faster than what you're doing in your, in your street car. So the forces are much larger. Um, so for a road car, they're going to be primarily focused on drag and um, noise. That's the two big things. So they take kind of what the aero or the um, vehicle designers, so they'll, you know, craft up a shape and, and, you know, they have, it's amazing. Actually, these guys, I make fun of them sometimes, but they're actually really talented. So the people who design cars can draw things that like, you know, you or I would look like Fred Flintstone drew it. And so like, you can look at things like you see this line on here and they'll show you like, oh, this is to make it look like it's moving when it's stopped and they'll show it to you without it. And you're like, oh, it actually does look that way. So I'm not gonna make fun of you anymore. So you sort of know what you're doing. But at the same time, they'll say like, well, I want this shape, but maybe there's a way to make that shape uh, engineering wise a little better. So you try to meet their vision with you know a minimum disruption, but still hit the goals. So in the case of an electric car, 
you obviously want the drag to be an absolute minimum, right? Because it affects your battery range and all that. If you tell everybody you've got 300 miles of range and they only get 220 in the real world, they're not gonna be happy. Um, so really in, in, in the road car world, the only cars that are similar to race cars are like the very, very high performance um, vehicles. So they're gonna have a similar development path to what a race car would have. So then we talk about downforce. Everybody knows what that is. They, most of them have heard, have heard of it. Um, so it's really actually super simple. Uh, basically, the way a car can go around a corner is there's a certain weight on the tires. Uh, it's basically in, and then there's a mu from the tires. So whether it's one or whether it's 0.9, you know, for a road car tire, it's gonna be 0.85 or whatever it's gonna be. Race tires can typically get over one. So meaning that, you know, you have hundred pounds of force down on the tire, it can generate 110 pounds of lateral force. So um, the more force you put down on the car, uh, the more lateral force it can generate. So the difference between a road car and race car, so this is an AMG uh, Roadster, basically it's lateral cornering capability is gonna be uh, mu times the weight down on the four tires. The race car version is that plus the arrow. However, the, when you add the downforce, it doesn't necessarily, uh, it, well, it doesn't increase the weight of the car. So that means to send, as far as lateral acceleration, it's got more capability to accelerate the same amount of weight. So that means instead of pulling one G, now it can do 1.5 or two. And that can get all the way up to, you know, in the case of Formula One car, you know, you can be at 5.5 Gs um, lateral cornering, which is bordering on, you'd be snapping the wings off a of Cess uh, Cessna, you know, from an aero perspective, so. And then uh, this is just an example of uh, side force and yawing moment. So kind of showing here, there's, uh, you know, significant lateral uh, pressure on the car depending on what it's doing, whether it's, uh, whether it's in yaw going around a corner, but it's important to the stability like we talked about. So if you get a massive disruption on the front of the car or the rear of the car, um, it can cause uh, a lack of stability, uh, all these other things. So, and we'll see an example of that shortly. Um, so in summary, my brief uh, aero, aero thing for cars, aero uh, summary is drag is, sort of important, not really. Um, depends on how long the straights are and how much power the vehicle has. So lift and downforce, it typically always makes a car faster. So it's not really gonna matter for like maybe a top fuel dragster, right? But for most circuit vehicles where they're going around the track, it definitely um, always improves performance. Um, so you're gonna be able to accelerate faster, brake later and corner faster. And that typically ends up in faster lap time. And that's the only thing you care about. Um, and then, so with that downforce is important that it's consistent because, um, you know, a vehicle is like, you think of a plane, right? So a plane is going, it's pitching at different angles. Same thing with the car, right? So when it breaks, it goes nose down. When it accelerates, it goes nose up. When it hits a bump, it might roll. It might do all these things. So if the downforce level is changing dramatically, that's not really a good thing. So it, it needs to be as consistent as you can make it. Um, so then side force and yawing moment. Um, yawing moment is really important in oval racing. Um, so we have really long corners that are banked uh, around a long time. So feeling stable in there. So when they feel that it's like a reassuring feeling that the car doesn't necessarily wanna just fall into the corner, um, so it, it's really a um, kind of a thing that is dependent on the human element of driving. So uh, yeah, let me show, I'll show you some examples, but here's an extreme example of uh, a roll change, um, obviously hitting a massive curb here. And then this is a Corvette that's under braking. So that car is gonna be nose down, pitch down. And what usually happens when you pitch nose down is, is the aerodynamic balance of the car. So more of the percentage of downforce is gonna be on the front of the car. So this thing's probably about 70% front right now, which is good because you can see the front brakes are doing all the work here. 
So that works out for this car, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you want that all the time. You'd rather have it be about the same as much as you could make it. So, and then here's a kind of a graphic example I'll show you of a yawing moment change and what happens to the car. So this is an amalgamation of about 36 CFD runs. So each of these dots would represent another car. So in this case, it would be right next to this one. This car is always in the same position. And then um, we're gonna move this car around and we've kind of plotted it graphically of what happens to it. So what these colors represent is when a car is in this position, what does that mean? So it means that, and in the case of this video, what you're gonna see is a car is gonna go straight by this other one like this. So when that car gets to about here, this car wants to understeer. So which means it's gonna, if you were turning left, it would wanna kind of keep going to the right. So you'd be like, oh, I gotta turn more to get it to go. But then as it goes past there and gets to like kind of the middle of this car, now it does the opposite. So now this car is gonna to wanna to spin out. And I'll show you a visual example of what that looks like. I'll play it one more time you can watch this car pretty much get sucked around by the other one and then you know, from that point on, it kind of depends what the driver does, but it's basically a very unstable um, system at that point. So the driver has to do the right thing and likely they can't at that speed because it's so, it's so dramatic and so fast. And, you know, um, you know, you're going 140 miles an hour. So very tiny um, inputs upset the system um, significantly. So that's why uh, side force and yawing moment is important. Um, so then I'll kind of talk about a little bit of how we develop things. Um, so, you know, you guys are used to doing um, stuff and you're probably exposed to CFD. You're probably exposed to smaller scale wind tunnels or water tunnels. Um, kind of show you what the, what the high dollar mainstream aero stuff is. So pretty much four options. You've got CFD, you've got scale wind tunnels, full size wind tunnels and track testing. Um, CFD, great, I love it. So I have done CFD um, for most of my PhD and, and a lot of our actual uh, tunnel work is led by CFD. So we, uh, we do a ton of CFD work um, and it lets you do things that you can't do with uh, in the wind tunnel. So in the wind tunnel, you can have one vehicle, you know, you can learn a little bit, but you can't see what's happening really. You can do you know, PIV and try to do other things, but it typically is not worth the effort um, and it's not worth the cost. And I'll get into that in a bit, but like you can see here, you know, to duplicate this image in a wind tunnel would be very, very expensive. Um, and you wouldn't be sure it was right because no, there's not many tunnels in the world that could accommodate a rolling road with two vehicles. I don't know of any, um, you can do one, but you can't do two. And you can, in, in this case, you can measure forces on both, both vehicles. You can move this one over, you know, two feet, run it again, you know, all that. So CFD is really powerful and insightful. Um, it's pretty cost effective per run. It's not cheap. So NASCAR spends probably, uh, I'd say about 400,000 a year on CFD. We spend about 250 on, yeah, so 3,000 runs, 250,000 in CPU time alone. Um, you can get CFD from anywhere, right? So you can go start up a race team, go to uh, ANSYS or go to STAR and say, well, it's Siemens now, and say, uh, hey, I need CFD help. They can help you. Um, negatives to it, correlation. So you run an open wheel car, you know, it might say a wing separates at X ride height. That might not be true. Now you have to validate it. So now you're wind tunnel testing. Now you're doing all this, right? So there's always that. You definitely need people who can analyze it. So you can't just take the data as you're given and, and go from there. You need people who can think about it. Um, software costs are pretty high. So we pay about hundred grand in licensing per year. CPU time, like I said, um, it's very, very expensive. 
and then the detail stuff uh, is difficult. So you got panel gaps, you have uh, you know radiators, things of that nature. So that all is something that uh, you know is different than real life. So then scale tunnels. Um, scale tunnels are a little more cost effective, um, but can also be very expensive. And they look cool. So people who are, you know, managers can look at this and say, hey, this is a real thing. I like this. But if you guys are an AIAA, what is the first thing you think of? Oh, I have a 60% scale model. So my Reynolds number's wrong. So yeah, extrapolate from there. Basically everything is wrong. So this the you know, the tires don't deflect like they're supposed to. The separation point is wrong on the front wing, which is makes it wrong on the back and makes it wrong on the diffuse and everything is wrong. So now you need to be an expert in what does correlation mean between a scale tunnel and a you know a full size model. They do cost less, um, but they you know cost less per hour, but the parts aren't that much cheaper. So you can 3D print a lot of stuff, but like in the case of, I have a lot of good friends over at Haas uh, F1. So they have to 3D print things out of metal. And the reason they have to do that is because they test that enough force that it would deflect a plastic 3D printed part um, in a in not realistic manner. So now all the wing elements need to be made out of metal because it's got to be strong enough to imitate what the real carbon part would do. So now you're talking, now you have $10 million uh, you know, metal printers that are working 24-7 to make parts for this thing. Um, so yeah, like a thousand bucks an hour for the tunnel, hundred thousand for just the spine. So the spine is like a big aluminum thing with like a bunch of actuators in it. So it sort of holds it like here and it moves the model like this, but that whole thing is, you know, all fancy electronics and fancy stepper motors and all that. So it gets really expensive. And the people who work on it are for sure uh, talented. So like in the UK in what they call the Motorsport Valley where all the F1 teams are, you know, there's all these model makers and all that. So you can find these guys easy. When you come to like America, it's like, okay, there might be a few around Indy, but like, you know, it's sort of a specialized skill. Um, and they're used to working on these like little tiny cars and they make all these parts and they're very detail oriented people. So it's not like you can just go get some guy um, you know, for 10 bucks an hour or girl for 10 bucks an hour and just expect the results to be good. It's like you need this expertise, right? And that all goes into correlation. So when you're off by an eighth of an inch in a real car, that's one thing. When you're off by an eighth of an inch in a model car that's already scaled, that's an even bigger thing, right? So now you do that enough times, now you don't know what you have and you don't know what, um, you know, as far as performance, do we believe this thing? Do we not believe it? Do we need to test in full scale? So there's no, it's not some magical thing having a uh, scale model. And then now you get to the, uh, the big guys, which is the um, full scale wind tunnel. So this is a stationary floor wind tunnel, it's aerodyne. And then this is a wind shear here, which is a rolling road. So that road there is a, you can kind of see it, stainless steel belt. It's like a giant treadmill. Um, that belt costs three hundred thousand dollars. It's driven by a five thousand horsepower um, motor, and that red button that I was showing you before is the emergency brake for that motor. The fan in here is ten thousand horsepower. Um, so ten thousand horsepower. This tunnel can go one hundred and eighty miles an hour uh, wind speed. It's an open jet section, so basically it uses probably the amount of power as you're like hometown, which would be, you know, basically this tunnel uses so much power that between four or 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. in the summer, between like May and August, they're not allowed to run or it's a thousand dollars a minute if they do because it consumes so much electricity. But it's one of the best tunnels in the world. So the reason it's one of the best tunnels is the rolling road simulation, right? So uh, there's a couple tunnels that can do this. So Volkswagen Audi has a, a tunnel similar, but it's not commercially available. So uh, Gene Haas built this um, back in like 2008 um, for his ambitions with his NASCAR team, but it's a privately operated tunnel now. So you can 
you know, you guys as NC State can book time here if you could afford it. It's 4,000 an hour. Um, so yeah, pretty reasonable. Starts when they open the door, so you better be quick. Um, so this is us at hour 18. So all wind tunnels are boring, um, no matter how, I guess if you're scared of what's gonna happen, it, it gets entertaining, but they're pretty boring. So we do a lot of marathon tests, you know, 15, 20 hours, um, because you have to take the time when you can. And, you know, your transportation and park costs are kind of fixed. So if you're there, if you're in the tunnel, it, uh, you know, you, you might as well run the extra 10 hours versus like doing three shifts because, you know, you got to transport this thing. So semi trucks have to bring five cars to this, uh, this particular test and, you know, you can see my friend Mike here. He's uh, he's absolutely had it. He's in the 60s. So staying up for 20 hours is not his forte. That's me there. So anyways, yeah, they're all boring. But on the upside, the correlation is very good. So a moving ground is about as good as you can do. Um, you can test real cars, so you don't need to have a model of a car. So you can take a race car that you built, you know, a real car, even a road car, run it in the tunnel and it's fine. Um, Cost, yeah, four thousand an hour. So you do a ten-hour shift, you're at forty grand. That's without parts and without transportation and without people. So you're talking, you know, probably in the realm of a hundred thousand per test. Um, so yeah, sorry, I jumped forward. Now I'm on track stuff. Whoops, hitting on but so track testing, um, kind of. I would say track testing is unique. So track testing is obviously the real world and people are gonna believe it, but it's also harder to get an accurate read on certain things because it is the real world. Real world. So if you're trying to test a car, just strictly going in a straight line, think of all the things that could go wrong, right? The guy doesn't inflate the tires right. Um, so now the tire resistance changed. The wind gusted. You know, when you're looking for a fraction of a percent of a mile per hour. Um, so this was a test here. What I'm showing you is uh, CFD versus, um, so we had this keel probe array. And if you look at the front of this car, we were changing the shape of the front to get the wake to be different. And the reason we wanted that was because we wanted a vehicle behind this car to get pushed away more than it was. So we needed the wake to stay more attached than it was. And so we ran the skill probe array in the tunnel and then on track. You know, it, it worked out, um, but that was a very good case of doing track testing. When you're doing track testing, like trying to see if this thing will go faster because of a change you made, I mean, you can get to some tracks where you do five laps and the tires are two seconds slower. So like now, how do you evaluate it? So do you change tires every time? They're $2,500 a set. So you're literally gonna change tires 40 times in a test to get an accurate result. So it's not easy. Um, so yeah, like pros, obviously it's there, you can see it. Um, you know, it's real life, that makes it fun. The cons are it's hugely expensive. So our engines are $150 per mile to lease. Um, tires are 2000 a set. So track run all 25 a day is kind of like modest. We go up to 50. Um, so then you figure about 10 grand a day for the team. Um, that's if you got like 10 people. Um, so it ends up being this just gargantuan expense of like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And certainly you come out of it and sometimes you, you won't be able to honestly say you've made anything better. So, yeah. Um, now I was kind of going to talk a little, so that was hopefully a little bit of background on the, the rough and dirty dive into uh, race car aero and development, and then kind of talk a little bit about some of the recent things that we've done. And then hopefully if you guys have any questions after, you can ask me about it. So this was a development example of the next gen car, which is coming out in 2022, uh, diffuser flap for it. So you can see it here. This is the diffuser of the uh, next gen car. So my team designed this. Um, you can see this right here, this section. 
So this is the flap of the diffuser. And why we have that, I mentioned all that liftoff testing, right? So obviously uh, cars not flipping over is very important to us. So we developed this flap um, and it's actually never really been done, honestly. Um, so this is the diffuser removed from the car standing up. So that's about, it's about five and a half feet tall right there. So you can see this flap down. So what happens is this flap, when the car spins around, it drops down and then blocks the diffuser so air can't get under it. Um, and I'll show you how we developed it. So the way we developed it, like I said, is we always do CFD first. And the reason is because wind tunnel testing is so expensive. So we had to do our wind tunnel testing in Ottawa, Canada, um, pay customs to get across the border, send a vehicle up, actually we sent two cars the first time, build all the parts and the wind tunnel bill was probably about 70,000. So the wind tunnel bill was 70,000 and then we probably spent about 120. So we're about 200 grand in there. So we damn near need to make sure that this was gonna work, right? So this is a multi-body CFD simulation. I want you to watch back here uh, of that flap working. So in that case, the car is backwards and we have it being passively deployed. So it starts from a steady state CFD simulation and then we activate the multi-body to where this flap can then um, rotate. And so we proved that it would deploy itself. And what we were working on really, you see this kind of scoop shape up here and I'll go back and you can see it right here. You can see that shape. That shape ended up being really important because it kind of put a lot of pressure on the top of the flap. So when it was released, it really wanted to go down. So that's what we were showing here um, was that this scoop was very important and we'd kind of gotten it. So we had done a bunch of different work where we, we would deploy this thing and it wouldn't really actually deploy. You'd let it go and it would kind of float. And the reason was the pressure distribution on top and bottom was equal. So this really helped us get this right. Um, and then I'll show you here. So this was one of our first tests in real life. Um, we took this thing to uh, one of the tunnels local and just kind of put it in backwards and put the brakes on and said, let's just see if we can get it to deploy. Um, so here's one of our first examples. This thing's like all aluminum. It's all like hodgepodge together. Um, so we're trying to see if this will even work. And I'm filming this off a of TV because there's no direct windows into the, so you can see it go there. There's no direct windows into that tunnel. So the only way you can see it is on TV. Um, so then here's us at, uh, they call it ACE. It's like the Automotive Center of Excellence at the University of Ontario um, in Oshawa, Canada. And the reason we ended up there um, was because Chrysler told us we couldn't go to Chrysler anymore because we were breaking their uh, wind tunnel. So that was kind of a problem. So, uh, and the reason why this testing is difficult is because a lot of wind tunnels can uh, blow wind at a certain speed, right? Like this is Chrysler's tunnel on the right. Like this massive section looks perfect. Chrysler's tunnel can spin 180 degrees. So you can start forward, you can rotate it all the way to 90 and just keep going. And uh, so it's really unique in that way. Like this ACE tunnel here, it can go to 180, but it needs to be done in like increments. So they have to like, they can only go about 30 degrees at a time. So you have to literally like move the whole thing and it's this whole deal. But a lot of tunnels can't even get that far. Like most tunnels can only yaw to about maybe six to eight degrees. So Chrysler was unique, but they found out that we were overloading their balance when we would go to like completely sideways, which kind of makes sense, right? Like the tunnel's made to measure drag on a road car and we're running it at like hundred miles an hour with a car sideways. So the load on it was really high. So we had to figure out a new tunnel. And so the first question was like, if you look at these two tunnels, you can see the nozzle size difference, right? So Chrysler's tunnel has about a 30 square meter uh, nozzle. The ACE tunnel is not even close to that. So we were like, I don't know if this is gonna work because when we put this car sideways, it's gonna be damn near the size of this nozzle. Whereas at Chrysler, it was, it was still within the jet of the air. So we did a bunch of CFD simulating the actual tunnels. So we did um, 
CFD with free air where there was no tunnel structure. Then we did um, both ACE and the Fiat Chrysler. We simulated the entire test sections. So what we thought was we need these to be as close to this blue line as possible. And what you can see is that the ACE tunnel actually was better than we thought it was going to be. So it's closer to that. So we said, okay, let's go up there. It's going to be worth, you know, at least worth the trip. And here's uh, images of the two cars in there. This is the next gen. And then we took a uh, current um, car up there. And you can see this massive turntable. So uh, they would have to pick this thing up with an air bearing and then rotate it. And then they would stop it and put it back down. And then we could take a point. So for us to get a whole sweep of yaw took like, you know, probably 30 minutes. So we had to be really smart about how we were testing. Um, and they can do some cool stuff. So this uh, tunnel can go to like minus 40 degrees and they can like make snow in it and freeze ice all over a car and run it. Um, so they can do cool stuff, but from an aero side, it was a little bit of a you know new experience. Um, so now here's a video of the flap in its final configuration. So you can see this is the final diffuser here. Um, and you can see the flap in there. So we're turning the fan on, we're ramping the wind speed up, which you'll hear. And you can see the flap is there. So that was an example of like kind of a development project where we went from thinking it up to CFD to like actually testing it in a tunnel. And we then, it's been implemented on all of the test vehicles. We actually uh, deployed it by accident a few times. But anyways, um, you'll see this thing in 2022. And uh, yeah, so that I think is the end of my presentation, but hopefully that was a good brief overview of kind of what we do and um, how we use the tools. And, you know, I know a lot of people think NASCAR is uh, you know, kind of a, a goofy, goofy like redneck sport or something, but there's a lot of technology in it and we use a lot of technology in the same development methods and in fact a lot of our development time is really shortened so it makes it fun and it makes it exciting um so hopefully uh that was informative for you guys and yeah any questions i'd be glad to answer i've got one thanks for that uh great presentation um one one question i had is um so you're your work is with, I guess, like defining some of the, the regulations as far as the arrow goes. What, what freedoms do like the teams have for designing uh, like the arrow parts of the cars or is that kind of just spec? Yeah, it's mostly spec, especially on the next gen car. So I didn't get a lot into the underfloor of it because we haven't shown it much yet, but it clearly has a diffuser and it clearly has some stuff ahead of that. So the new car is, uh, you know, um, much more like a, a, a current uh, GT car where it's got a diffuser and a significant underbody. Um, NASCAR, this goes all the way back to the structure of the company. So NASCAR is a privately held company, right? So NASCAR has its own engineers and its own R&D center that sort of are in the interest of the company. So that's a little different than other race series, right? So we have, um, we're worried about safety. We're worried about how good the races are. We make all the rules and parts around that. And then the team side, what they do is operate as much within the rules as they can. Um, so they're given certain tolerances to do things. And, uh, you, you know, the tolerances are really intended to be able to put the car together, but they optimize everything to get the most out of what they have, if that makes sense. So there was a time when I think, you know, you know, certainly cheating was glorified in NASCAR. It's, it's sort of famous for that, right? I don't think it's that anymore. It's mostly um, they are doing the best with what they have. And, you know, the thing about racing that's a little different is people spend all the money they have, right? So, you know, we don't necessarily not want innovation. It's just that it doesn't, you know, people spend a lot of money to like, let's say, make more downforce. Well, 
it's really better for everybody if they didn't spend all that money because you know you know your every race team feels like they need to spend all the money they have plus 10 percent. so if everybody does that forever they're eventually bankrupt right so nascar tries to maintain the health of the whole industry by stopping them from doing that and you know they even ask us like hey we're spending all this money in in some of these areas we really need to like clamp down on it and then we'll react and say okay you can't you can't do these things or or whatever or try to engineer it out but you know you certainly don't want situations where people can outspend others and you know end up winning and and and, and then forcing others to spend more money cuz it's like you end up on this economic uh, disaster right um, and that's really what it comes down to is like we all want to have a viable industry where you make money and you can race and you can engineer but like don't run yourself out of business trying to do this okay yeah thanks yeah it makes a lot of sense thanks i had a quick question for you sure so when you're creating and coming up with these changes to improve the cars have you ever experienced a team that's almost unwilling or disagrees with the changes that you're suggesting? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, man, I've been, we suggested an entire race in 2018 when we, we ran the all-star race, designed an aero package that had like maximum downforce and like no horsepower. And everybody thought we were just idiots. And, you know, we went and did it and the race was good. And, you know, like it's one of those things of, yeah, there's a lot of opinions, right? There's people who, and I would say NASCAR is a unique, a unique um, sport in that a lot of you guys are probably really too young to remember, but you know, in like in the 10, 20 years ago, it was more popular than the NFL. So it became really, really popular like 2006, 2007. Um, a confluence of factors made that true, right? So like, you know, just the age group of people, who the drivers were, whatever. But, you know, people like associate that. It's like, you know, when you listen to old songs, like people are like, well, 20 years ago was the greatest thing ever. Well, you're like, well, was it really? So people in NASCAR, I think a lot of times have, have uh, these golden glasses of like this old era where they think everything was great back then. It, it really wasn't like it's super competitive now. The racing's great now. Um, but you know, when you look at a highlight reel of an entire decade, well, you take 380 races, yeah, you can put together an hour highlight reel, right? But so that's where the disagreements come is like direction wise and stuff. The I'd say the industry as a whole, teams and all that, safety is no argument anymore, especially after what happened with like Earnhardt and these other people. Um, our safety guys, I would say, are the best in the world. And, um, you know, like stuff like, I don't know if you saw the Haas F1 crash where Romain Grosjean was in a fire for like, you know, 30, 40 seconds and got out okay. But like our guys were challenging um, the fire suit manufacturers on, they would like screen print these logos and they were like, prove that that isn't worse, right? And it ended up that they were. So they went back to the drawing board and like fixed it. And then Romain Grosjean got in that crash. And if you search a, um, you know, Romain Grosjean, Bahrain or something, you'll see this crash and it's horrible. He's like literally in the car and it's on fire and for like 30 seconds he climbs out. He did get burned, but, um, you know, it's kind of cool to know that our guys uh, had a role in pushing that stuff forward. So, um, yeah, to answer your question, we certainly get disagreement, but not on anything related to safety. So everybody's got an opinion, right, on what a race should be and what what's entertaining, but nobody disagrees on safety, I would say. Thank you. I had a question real quick. Sure. Uh, so when developing the next gen car, what kind of compromises did you have to uh, deal with, you know, to balance aero grip versus mechanical grip or any of the other challenges such as the yaw moment where along the straightaway on a mile and a half track, the cars are pitched out in the right rear 
or at the 2020 Kansas race where Harvick had trouble getting around Logano because of dirty air. So what kind of compromises did you have to deal with in order to develop the next gen to where you guys believe it's going to be the best car yet? Um, so that's a good question and you could probably talk about it for an hour. So I'll try to not do that, but, um, the big things are, so the car is symmetric, right? So that's one thing. So the car right now, the back end of the car is actually bent over, um, about four inches to the right or two and a half inches. So it's bent over to give it a yawing moment to where it wants to rotate, like kind of to the right from the top. And that makes it stable when it, makes a left turn on the flip side that makes it uh, have aero dependency and from a manufacturer standpoint it makes it be different from left to right so now these designers have to the, you know one side of the car looks a certain way and then you go to the other side and it's all flat and they're trying to like have character in it so the car is completely symmetric now it makes it number one it's way better looking um you're gonna see the cars get revealed here in, you know probably the next month or so um, they're all very good looking. So we're going to do that. I think we've learned that from an aero side, uh, having more than one aero package is very important. So, you know, on short tracks, you want to have low downforce and, you know, tire wear and all these things. Um, and then certain other tracks, it's unavoidable that aero is going to play a role. So we want to get what we want out of it. Um, but I will say that the car with the bigger wheels and bigger tires and all that, it has a lot more mechanical grip. So uh, braking wise, it's a lot more like a sports car. Um, everyone that drives it says how, you know, you know, the brake rotors are 15 inches in the front um, or 15 and a half or whatever they are. So absolutely massive. Like this, it's just a very modern car, very modern everything. Um, it's a really, uh, really well done car for, you know, a variety of tracks for the future. So whether NASCAR runs more road courses, um, ovals, it can do all that. Um, it's hard to get away from the fact that, you know, you think of an airplane. Um, I don't know if any of you are pilots. Um, I tried to be for a long time. I realized I was just going to get killed. Um, <laughs> so my brother's actually an airline captain and uh, he does it every day. But, you know, there's a certain reality that when you take a plane off in front of another plane, like, so, you, you know, my brother flies a, a 767, rotates at, you know, 180 knots. Um, that thing, that's a lot of weight um, and moving a lot of air. So if you try to take off in your Cessna behind that, you're going to have a pretty bad time. Um, so a race car is the same thing. There's no getting around the fact that putting another car, you know, in front of another one is going to have an effect. So we do everything we can to make sure that they can get away from each other that we minimize that wake, it'll always be there. So it's one of those things that you have to uh, kind of make the, make the best choices. So that's why the track preparation matters. Like you gotta look at the whole picture. Can they run from the top of the wall all the way to the bottom? That's a good thing, right? Cause then they can be away from each other. But yeah, like to say, well, I'm gonna run 200 miles an hour right behind somebody Oh, You're probably not because you know, it's the same speed uh, 250,000 uh, pound plane rotate set. So obviously it's gonna have an effect, right? Like, I mean, you just think of a regular car, like um, it's just unavoidable. So I think it's, it's good. NASCAR has um, somewhat gotten away from thinking there's like a gimmick that'll fix everything. There's just not, it's like you either need to run slower or you, you know, give them more options or whatever, but you know, it's just physics, right? Like there's no escaping. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there any concern with the new diffuser? Uh, Cause I know, I know NASCAR does a lot more uh, bumping and just uh, bouncing into each other. Is there any concern like an F1 where they sustain like floor damage and then are just kind of a rolling chicane for the rest of the race? Is there any concern with that? Um, uh, yeah, it's a good question. So actually a lot of the design was driven by those considerations, right? So um, if you look at when the next gen gets revealed, and if you remember this conversation, um, the sides of the car, so we didn't put any protruding floor where it sticks out and the diffuser 
um, if you look at it, it's undercut pretty far under the nose. So we made sure that, or the tail of the car. So we made sure that if a car hit the back of another one, it couldn't get to um, that point where it would hit anything. So uh, there was that, but then on the sides, so we made the, the sides of the car kind of very, uh, very smooth and very, they're actually really beefy. So that if they hit side to side, um, you know, it's not like some race ending damage where like a lot of performance is lost. So a lot of those things, when you look at the car, when you can finally see like the real pictures of it, you'll see some of the things I'm talking about where like, go with the absolute best arrow configuration, we kind of weighed that against other factors. So yes, there's a diffuser, but yes, it does not, you can't get to it by hitting the back of another one. You really would have to, you know, probably back in the wall at 100 miles an hour to get there, so. Awesome, thank you. Hey, Eric. Nice to see you again after a, a while. Hey, how are you? Um, good, and you? Um, that I know with COVID and everything, and now that you're done, don't get to see you as often, but it's nice to see you presenting here. Um, and I'm glad to see the diffuser work kind of continues to move forward. Um, do you, is the, I guess my only question is, is the diffuser included in this year's All-Star Aero package? Or I don't know if you can answer that or maybe not. No, um, because, so the floor of the car for the, the new car is so, um, it's just like one of those things like, I mean, a lot of the reason for the next gen car, honestly, was that we wanted to do all these things, but we knew we couldn't get there with like, you know, we keep trying to like fix. It's like you've been building this thing over eight, you've been building a house and you keep putting additions on it, right? Yep. And at some point you like have to just start over. So we got to the point with the next gen or the current car where we said, hey, we just got to start over. Like we know what we want it to be. So we'll have it with this floor and like, you know, all the mounts are, it's welded by a, uh, with, they have like robotic welding machines that are putting these things together. Um, you know, really, really good quality, good consistency. Um, the price is crazy low for what the car is like crazy low, but yeah, the diffuser and all that, like you, it would be a, just a nightmare to put it on a current car, um, because it just doesn't have any of the, the ability to do it. And that's where like, you know, like I said about NASCAR being a, uh, a privately held, con I mean, you know, right. So you, we think about the cost and we think about all these things. Um, so you can't have a race that's not for money or anything and, and impose all these costs. And then you don't know what's going to happen, right? So somebody might do a good job trying to put this diffuser on, somebody might not. So it's a lot of, a lot of thought that goes into things. And uh, yeah, it just wouldn't work. And honestly, the loading on it is actually frightening. So the diffuser itself will carry about 1,800 pounds of downforce. So if you think about that, that was only the panel that I showed you. So that five foot section, and actually it's all within the first foot of it. So you have about, you know, five PSI on, on some of these sections of this carbon. And so if it really wanted to let go, I mean, it would ex explode off the bottom of the car. So, so it's kind of scary in that way of how much force um, it can generate. Ground effect is obviously a, a hugely powerful thing. So, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I, I remember great. from your from your dissertation, all that ground effect stuff. It just gets overly complicated. <laughs> yeah, especially when you tell Granlin just do CFT. Don't try to <laughs> don't try to make your analytical models. <laughs> yeah, I, and I guess one last question. I know that at least during my time at NASCAR, there were like plans in the future, which in my time at NASCAR was a while back now, but I know that there were plans for the the real test, like the real time test that you were showing at the track, right? Like the, the track testing. Was that something you got to do, I guess, last year in the midst of COVID or was it beforehand? Or are you guys looking to do it anymore anytime soon, even though it's super, super costly? Yeah, I mean, so we, uh, we tested last month at Richmond. Um, it's obviously been difficult with COVID, like we limit the amount of people. So people are really only going to stuff if they need to. And 
Um, we've had some COVID scares for sure because, uh, you know, you get, you get the wrong group of people out having beers and somebody gets exposed, right? Like, it's like, now all of a sudden the whole tower that runs a race is not available. So I think NASCAR has done a good job of kind of keeping people taking it seriously. And, you know, the testing protocol is pretty rigorous. Um, uh, we actually had uh, at Atlanta, we had um, COVID testing dogs where they can smell it. Um, so oh, they were cool. like, yeah, so they, uh, they were kind of like the first line of defense. So if you, if you, if the dog was set off to you, then you would get a rapid test right away and they would kind of isolate you before you got in the track. So that's kind of a new thing that I think they're hoping to do. So they've trained them to do that. It wasn't us, obviously, um, it's a company, but yeah, it's, it's been tough. Um, definitely minimized uh, the amount of people um, that go to things and, you know, it's made it more difficult to do our jobs for sure. Like I just said, did all that liftoff testing in Canada. We can't even go to Canada right now. I mean, I can, I'm a Canadian citizen, but um, you know, my team, if we were gonna go there, we'd pretty much have to get the government to approve it, probably have to quarantine for two weeks and then we'd have to do the wind tunnel test and then we'd have to go home. So it's like, you know, that's the reality of what we're, what we're dealing with is like, there's not even a tunnel in the world we can go to right now to do that. So, I mean, what do you do? Like, so yeah, it's been, it's been an absolute nightmare, just like it has been for you guys, you know, for classes, for doing anything, right? It's just been terrible. I've got another question um, about, I guess, some of the real world testing. So like both wind tunnel and on the track. Um, sure. What so what what do you guys I know you're saying how the CFD is quite helpful for visualizing like the flow interactions. Um, but do you guys use like the flow viz paint or like any other type of rakes or anything to sort of see what's happening uh, in real life? Or was that what you're saying? It can be kind of deceiving. Yeah, we do. And like that car picture I showed you is so we had a left and right side rake on each side of the car. Um, so we do do that and we do do. But, you know, a lot of it is. Uh, our cars aren't necessarily dependent on. Like if there is a vortex, right. It, it's a consequence of some other thing. I'm not using that vortex to do anything with. So whether that vortex is exactly right where I thought it was, or we're mostly interested in whether the, not necessarily the magnitude of the CFD is correct. So if I said, CFD says I added a hundred pounds and then we go to the tunnel and it adds 80 pounds. To me, that's a success, right? So the CFD was directionally correct and it was roughly correct in magnitude. So we always um, look at it that way you can really get yourself um, not only spending a lot of money, but also like just lost in the weeds by worrying about like, oh, I'm gonna run a hundred pressure taps. Well, what are you actually trying to do? So like that diffuser that you saw has, uh, we have a 128 channel scan -a valve system, like whatever the best one is. So it's like 50 grand and we run it um, when we need to, but like to even post-process that data from the tunnel, it takes like a day. So it takes a day and then like, what am I looking for? So what we do is we'll say like, let's look at this ride height point. Let's, uh, let's compare that to CFD, whether right or wrong. So in this case, CFD was right. The diffuser was better. So we just said, here's CFD and here's the diffuser. We put them next to each other. But if it was dead wrong, you would also do that and like be like, okay, what is going on here, right? this is way off this is way off but then like running rakes and doing all that it's like you got to look at everything like is it are the parts what i thought they were did we scan the parts like are they different shape was it installed wrong is it flexing when it's running like what is happening right so i think when you're in school and you're and i was the same it's like you want to run all this cool stuff right like i'm gonna run all these cool sensors but 
you really have to get down to like, what is the answer I'm trying to get to? And what is the easiest way to get there? Because you make your life harder when you add in a bunch of money and a bunch of technology, right? Sometimes you're just kind of like doing it for show, but you're not getting yourself any closer to the answer. So yeah, that's my long winded answer to do we run rakes? Yes, we do, but we do it very selectively. And that's because of my preference um, for how to do things. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense uh, since you put it that way. Yeah, thanks for that. I have a question about the, uh, you've talked a lot about the back end, and that's been really interesting to me. I have a question about more of the front end of the car, the splitter versus valence argument. I'm sure you've heard a ton about that ad nauseum. Um, with a new car, I haven't really gotten a chance to see the front end. I don't know what's under there. I know this weekend they ran without splitters at Bristol because of the dirt. Um, can you talk about the aerodynamic differences a little bit between the splitter and the valence and what your thoughts about that are with the new car? Yeah, so it does have a splitter, um, but it, well, splitter is, it's called, we call it the whole thing an underwing, right? So at the end of the day, the car is in ground effect and you can be happy or sad about that, but there's no escaping it. You're in ground effect from about four inches down, right? So it's going to be in ground effect. Um, the valence itself is very ride height sensitive. So one of the things that is hard for fans to understand is that in 1990, NASCAR teams didn't understand that ground effect was important. So they weren't doing wind tunnel testing on the bottom of the car. They didn't think it mattered. Well, from 2000 on, that's not true anymore, right? So you're almost comparing different things. You're comparing, I didn't know about something to when I knew about it. And so that is an inescapable difference. But the valence itself is, um, it's still very ride height sensitive. So it's ride height sensitive and all the things that still matter, like having, so right now with a ground effect car, you know, you want that all to be flat and you want that, you want to fill in all the gaps underneath it and all that makes you faster. So all that is still true. And, um, it really uh, doesn't affect the wake that comes off the car. It doesn't affect anything. So I think the splitter in the front of the car, yes, it's true. A car will uh, understeer or be tight behind another car because it has less air going on it, right? That makes sense. But it doesn't matter what it is. It's always going to have that unless you can magically fill in that hole that's in front of it. So whether it's a valence or whether it's this, um, you know, and there's arguments that can be made about running over grass, but the best thing is to not do it, right? Like, so you hit you hit grass at 120 miles an hour. If you think about your, you got a Toyota Corolla, would you like drive it across a baseball field at 150? Probably not, right? You would expect parts to come off the back of it. So, um, yeah, it it's it's one of those things. I think fans like again going back to that conversation of remembering the golden age, right? You're like, well. I saw this great race and they had a valence. And you're like, yeah, well, they also didn't know how to wind tunnel test back then. And they didn't have, you know, $40 million budgets per car. So, you know, it's one of those things of like, it's a multifaceted answer for sure. Um, but yeah, there is definitely a downforce loss being behind another car. Whether you got a valence or a splitter, <laughs> you know, you could argue which one's worse or slightly worse. But I can tell you that all of our studies show that the less ride height you have, so the closer to the ground, the better it is for the car behind. So it's the opposite of even what fans think. Like fans remember the old days when they used to be really high off the ground. Hey, the race was great. Well, yeah, but you can't prove that from an aero side because if I run that car at four inches and I run it at a half inch, the half inch one will be better. So, you know, it's one of those things of there's a, uh, there's a there's the fan perspective and then there's the physics and then there's what actually happens and sometimes the answer is between all those right it's not really either of them so thank you yeah I had another question sure um, so how much input did the race teams and manufacturers have because you have at least right now three different manufacturers with three different fascias so I'm sure that, that also had a post a challenge for you guys yeah um and let me jump back here um a second see if this will help 
try to find a good picture of it. Um, they, so we interface with the manufacturers a fair bit, right? So we obviously uh, control, we're sort of the end decider of what happens, but at the same time, like, especially on the aero side, we work with them a lot to uh, bring them along kind of on the journey. Um, let me get to a next gen picture here so I can show you. But you know, we, um, yeah, this one might work. So let me go to that. So we work with the manufacturers um, and this is another example. So this body here is sort of like a car wash body. Um, I, that's what I call it. Um, like, you know, when you buy a bottle of uh, uh, car wash soap and it kind of looks like every car, this is exactly what this is. So this was designed by a, a designer out of LA. He sort of like merged all the cars together. And we just made this generic vehicle. So we had a body to test with, but the manufacturers in NASCAR, there's like elements around here, like the wheel bands, the angle of this section, the greenhouse here, like all of this, we all designed kind of as a group. So we were doing CFD and saying, we're okay with this. And then they would say, well, we want this for styling. And we'd say, okay, we're gonna run in CFD. But anyways, we give them then this skeleton structure where we say, now you've got to design a car that meets all these elements and then also passes the wind tunnel test, right? So like, you know, they'll have character in the doors and they'll have this and that and, you know, uh, It'll, it'll, their body outline will still be like this and it'll still meet all these elements I'm talking about. But they'll have all this character in it. Aerodynamically, it tests out okay. So uh, yeah, they have a lot of input um, and really on the OEM side is where we define a lot of that. Um, so yeah, I hope that an answers your question. Um, team wise, you know, they're really focused on what they're doing. Like, so their, their, their job is to make money, right? And to race and to win. And that's how they do it. So they sell sponsorships, um, you know, and running well sells sponsorships. So a lot of team guys are focused on that and rightfully so, because that's their, that's their job. So we collaborate with the teams. We keep them informed of what we're doing, but really a lot of this work happens between us and the OEMs. And then it eventually it trickles down to the, the team side. So Hopefully that makes sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Eric? Uh, we're, we, are, we did run a little over, so I don't want to hold anyone too late, but any last minute questions? I, I got one. Go ahead, uh, Connor. Can you talk a little bit about your uh, CFD methodology? Like I, I was in charge of the CFD for our senior design team and I know I ran into a lot of problems. Can you just kind of talk about how you guys go about doing it? Yeah, um, I, it's funny because um, that's the one area where just like we um, are just using money to spray down the problem, right? So compared to a Formula SAE team, we're running three, 400 million cell models. I'm running on 2000 cores. We're running 50 cases a day, right? So, I mean, you know, we're just like destroying it with grid and power and uh, computing and software. Like we have the best pre-processor and, you know, like we, we do all these things where it's really like on an industrial scale, right? So we're, we have automated ride height changes. We have all these things. So, you know, you got, you've got like an ANSYS license where you're, you're limited to a hundred thousand cells or wherever you're limited to. It's like, you know, there's a hundred thousand cells on like this leading edge right here. You know what I mean? Like on that yeah. section within a millimeter of it. And then, you know, so really it's a lot because it's a bluff body and because it's got rotating wheels, it's got all these things. So it's a very dirty uh, vehicle, no matter what any car is. Um, so you just have to kill it with grid and kill it with, and the only way to get it fast is to do as many CPUs as possible. So like I said, we're running, you know, 24 hours on, on 500 CPUs and we're, uh, you know, running 300, 400 million cells. We have 15 terabytes of storage at OSC. I mean, it's like, you know, when you talk to somebody and, and 
you know, even like when I did, uh, like our domain is 160 meters long. So we're running this gargantuan domain with like 50 by 50 um, a box because we don't want any interference from anything. We don't care how much computationally it costs. So it's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot different. We run a lot of steady state and um, because for this car, steady state for the most part is, is perfectly fine unless you're searching for minute details or you know things. So we run a lot of steady state, we run wall functions, um, we run all that. So uh, there's nothing wrong with any of those methods. It's really just like, uh, you gotta know what you're trying to do. And, and you know, like when you're trying to do a Formula SAE car open wheel, and you've got anything less than hundred million cells, it's like, it's gonna be what it's gonna be, but you know, it's, it's not gonna be right. Like uh, F1 teams right now are around a billion cells give you an idea. So they're around a billion. The reason they're around a billion is because the flow is so gnarly off the wheels and all the rest of it, right? Um, so yeah, that's just, uh, that's the answer. It's like, it's like yeah, you're, you're trying to solve a problem that you don't quite have the right tools yet for, but you'll get there when you get, you know, you get my job and then you'll be able to blow a couple hundred grand on CPU time and then you'll, <laughs> you'll have the answer. So are, are, do you guys use like store-bought stuff like Ansys or Star CCM or are you like self-coded, self-made? No, nobody, that, that's like a graduate school thing where people are like, yeah, make this in MATLAB. I mean, shit, if I told my boss I was going to write my own CFD code, I'd have been fired a long time ago. But yeah, you can't keep up with them either. Like, uh, so we're uh, actually moving to Star and uh, they update that software three times a year. So you got to figure three times a year, they're fully updating that. Like, Star is pretty unreal, like what it can do and how efficient it is. Um, but yeah, so we run a, a version of Open Foam that was customized by Total Sim out of Ohio right now, um, but we're moving to Star. And uh, yeah, it, we don't do much ourselves, honestly, because you just can't, number one, you don't have the time for it, right? Like we need answers on this. I don't need to be coding CFD that already somebody's already done, right? So yeah. that's kind of a, uh, the decisions you have to make. It's like anything else. How do I want to spend? You got limited time and you got limited money. So you got to spend it how you is most, you know, what's most effective. But yeah, don't go to your first job and tell them you're going to write your own CFD. <laughs> I'll give you that tip. <laughs> Hold on. And then uh, just one last question. So you said you were running a 160 meter domain with like 400 million nodes on 2000 cores. Like how long does that take? So we run like, uh, uh, Usually, so let's say we run 200 cores um, and, and about, you know, 200 million cells on a single car model. That'd take like eight hours. Um, so we run on OSC, Ohio State Supercomputing Center has a couple of different um, clusters. Uh, we run on Owens. So Owens is one of the newer ones, but not the fastest one. So it kind of depends on the hardware and it depends on what you're trying to do, right? So like a lot of times for us, we need more memory than we do um, necessarily cores. So we run more cores to get more memory. Um, so like there's all these things with CFD, right? Like CFD, you can run a zillion cores, but if they can't talk to each other fast enough, you're limited by how fast they can talk. So yep. your interconnect speeds matter and all these other things. So um, I've certainly run things where you can you reach a point where it doesn't go any faster because that's all it's got. Like it's not talking fast enough. The memory access isn't fast enough. There's all these things. It's actually an NC state deal. Um, we had an intern, we were doing some dynamic Ahmed body things where we were stretching a mesh, but like we just could not get it to go any faster. Like we were running 2000 cores and uh, yeah, it's like, so yeah, we typically aim for eight, seven, eight hours. It's a good number because you come in in the morning. So you get, get a bunch of runs going during the day and then you come in the morning and they're done. Right. So you, when they run for a day or two, that starts to be, you know, you're waiting on the answer and you better hope you didn't screw up anything. Right. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, I got to run guys. Um, hopefully I didn't keep you guys too long. <laughs>